It was the first time she'd ever made me dinner since we'd been married. And it was delicious. It was great. Clean the plate. Didn't even feel obligated. Because it, my mindset was once we're married, I don't, have to, I don't have to act anymore. You know, we said before God and family and friends, till death do us part. The act's over, baby. This is all of me. So whereas when we were dating, especially, even if I didn't like it, I'd have cleared the plate just because. And, and when we were engaged, maybe not cleared the plate, but just left a couple bites. But I figured once we were married, if I didn't like it, whatever, all bets are off. But it was, it was legitimately delicious. And I was going back for seconds. And I came back over and I sat down at the table with the seconds. And my lovely bride looked at me and said, how many rolls have you had? <laughs> well, Jenny Craig, I don't know. I didn't... I didn't make it a habit to count how many rolls I've eaten. She's like, let me tell you, you've had four. I'm like, All right. There are eight in a package. There are two of us. I'm like, oh, is this what we're going to do now? Is this what we're going to do? Is this how our... She's like, well, I'm just saying. I'm like, what, what is the big deal? She's like, well, when you make the rolls, you can eat however many rolls you want. But when I make the rolls, I think I should be able to eat some rolls as well. I'm just like, Fine. I'll make the rolls. I did not know what I was signing up for. Now, Pillsbury has put something in those little crescent rolls that I just, I mean, it's a touch of heaven. And I just, so I went down to the, I went down to the supermarket and I got myself a thing of rolls. And I'm like, fine, I can do this. How hard is it? And then I bought like a rotisserie chicken because it was already made, right? I got dinner. You just, you don't worry about it. I'm taking care of you tonight. And I get home, and I have no idea how to open this container of crescent <laughs> rolls. Because in the same way they've squeezed little drops of heaven into their rolls, they've also decided to make these packages foolproof. And so not only can children not open them, but neither could I. And so I had to go online to discover how to open up the container because if you've never made crescent rolls, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. You're like, just open the container, you moron. It's not that hard until you get into your hands one of those crescent roll containers and then you've got to like peel off paper and then there's pressure point i mean it's like you're giving this tube of dough a massage just to get it to pop open so you can unroll the dough and bake up some crescent rolls it's near impossible and so i'm pushing on the tube in all these different places and all of a sudden i hear a pop and i'm like I'm not sure that's right, but then dough just starts oozing out of the container. I'm like, I can do this. All right. And then I've just got this mess of dough. And I, I remembered back for one Thanksgiving, watching somebody make crescent rolls. And there were these nice little perforated lines, and you would just rip it off and just roll up the dough real quick and pop it down on the tray. Next one, rip it off. I mean, they were, they were moving with precision and with speed. And I'm just dumbfounded at just this hunk of dough. And what am I supposed to do? I made something like rolls that night. And the parts that got cooked were delicious. I'm going to tell you. The parts that got cooked, phenomenal. The parts that were a little raw, a little, little doughy, a little chewy, not so good, not so good. But the rest of the container was absolutely, was the, the parts that got cooked, they were great. Never in a million years would I have ever imagined how difficult it was just to make some delectable crescent rolls out of one of those packages that they just fill the dough and they cram it in so that literally you have to massage the thing and it just oozes out when you open it up. This morning, we're going to continue clarity. And if you're just joining us, for the last three weeks, we've talked about Lakeside. And we've talked about what we want to be. We've talked about what we really believe God is calling us to be and the church that God is calling us to be. And so we started Clarity and we just said, we have seen historically God do some great things in the life of Lakeside, but we want to live so that the best is yet to come. 
We want to see even better days ahead. We want to see lives change. We want to see God work in powerful ways that when we look at our only explanation is that God is at work. And then we started saying, hey, this is what some of the future looks like. This is what we really believe that God is calling us to do and how we're going to take those next steps forward so that we can reach more people for Jesus, so that we can help more people in their spiritual journeys take the next step and become more like Jesus. And so we've, we've revealed in the last couple of weeks in detail that we are, we've hired a search firm, a national search firm, to aid us in our search for a full-time worship arts pastor. And then last week, we saw that we are, we are beginning the process now of searching for, the, for who will come on board the team as the family life pastor as well. And so we really believe that God is calling us to take these next steps to enhance the team. Why? So that we can have more impact, so that we can reach more people, we can pour into more people's lives, we can help more people in their spiritual journeys. That is what we want to do. We always want to reach more people. People for Jesus, and we want to help people grow to become more like Jesus in their spiritual journeys. That's what we're all about. That's why we say at, our, at Lakeside, the reason we exist, what our mission is, we exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from Him. And we really believe that these two key additions to our team will help us take the next steps in that process. And today, I want to look at some words that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 15. And some people may question, they may question, well, why? What's the heart behind this? Why why does Lakeside feel the need to go about this direction? What drives you? Why are you going for it? And we hope this morning that that question's answered. And so if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the Bible apps there. If you don't, no worries, you can follow along on the screen as we start this morning in Romans 15, starting verse 14, where we read these words. I myself, the Apostle Paul writes, am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. I myself am satisfied about you. I have peace about you. I feel good when I think about you, the Apostle Paul writes, that you are full of goodness, that you, in the same way the Pillsbury container just oozes out because it is so crammed full, that when he thinks of people, he thinks of them being so crammed full of goodness. It is the first thought that comes to his mind about them, that they are full of goodness. And I wonder, what do people People think about when they think about us is the first thought when people think about you that you are full of goodness that you are full of love that you are full of compassion that you are full of kindness that you are full of encouragement or is it something else that you're full of rage that you're full of bitterness that you're full of anger What do people think about when they think about you? And I understand, we can't can't determine how everybody in this world is going to think about us and all of us are going to be misunderstood. I understand that. But if the prevailing thought about you when people think about you is not that you're full of goodness and not that you're full of love and not that you're full of kindness and not that you're full of compassion and not that you're full of grace, then somewhere along the way things need to change in your life. May this be the case for us, that when people think about us, their prevailing thought is that we are full of goodness, and that we're full of love. May this be something that drives us, that we keep at the forefront, and that we constantly try to live our lives in such a way that we exude love in all we do, in all we say, and in in all situations we encounter, that we exude love, that people, when they think of us, their prevailing thought would be that we are full of goodness, not just that we've got some of that within us, not just that we're capable of it if you catch us in the right mood, if we've had our coffee between the hours of 10 and 2, no, 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 that people, when they think about us, would think of us prevailing thought 
all the time that we are full of goodness. And if that's going to occur, then what that means is that we have to exude love in every circumstance, in every situation. But may that be said of us, that when people think of us, they think, hey, they're full of goodness. They're full of love. They're full of compassion. And not, hey, that guy's a jerk. You don't want to cross him. Catch him on his bad day. Oh, I don't want to deal with him. He's miserable. And you can't, you can't shift. You can't shift the narrative overnight. Okay? So if people think of you in those terms, like you're a jerk and you're full of rage and you're angry and you're bitter and nobody wants to be around you, you're not going to shift the narrative overnight, but you need to make that shift immediately. But understand, it's going to take some time. And this is what's really disappointing about life, is if you have the other narrative, that you're full of love and you're full of kindness and you're full of goodness and you're full of mercy and you're full of grace, guess what? You can shift that narrative in a moment. That's just the reality of life. And so all the more we need to make sure that it is our aim and it is our desire that we live lives that when people look at us, they see that we are full of goodness and that is their prevalent thought about us, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. And we also need to be filled with knowledge. We also need to be able to understand what's going on, that we actually have a reason to say the things that we say and to believe the things that we believe. It's, it's not just that we feel a certain way, but no, we have facts behind that. And we're filled with knowledge that we can, we can articulate that, we can defend it when we need to. That's also part of the puzzle. Historically, Unfortunately, within Christianity especially, it seemed like people have, have landed on one side of this fence or the other. That for the people who are full of goodness, you're like, I, I don't know how much knowledge they have. And for the people who are really full of knowledge, they're an insufferable jerk who wants to judge everybody else. And so let's make sure that we don't put this up as like we have to choose one or the other. But let's aim for both. Let's make sure that we are aiming to be known as people who are crammed full of goodness and love and mercy and grace, but we also are people who know what we're talking about, and we have facts that, that correspond with those as well, that we're not just feeling-based and we're not just fact-based, that all of that comes together, and we are feeling and fact-based people who make sure that love drives us. And at the same time, we're full of knowledge. So let's make sure that that describes us individually. And if we make sure that that describes us individually, that will describe us collectively as Lakeside. And even more important than that, maybe that will start to change the narrative a little bit about people who follow Jesus. Because that's our aim. That's our goal. Our goal is not to build the legacy of Lakeside. Our goal is to build the name of Jesus. That is what drives us. Lakeside is an avenue and a vehicle to do that. But never forget, the destination is always that we want to point people to Jesus, not to ourselves, because we will always fail them. We will always fall short. But our desire is to point people to Jesus and see their lives changed as a result. But on some points, he continues, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a lot of dynamics going on here with, with Jewish people and Gentiles and all those things, and we'll dive into that some other time, maybe during a Bible study, if you, if you want. But we're just today, again, within the context of clarity, we're talking about how these things apply to us and what we want to do as a result 
result of them. And so very simply this, we shouldn't live in fear. We shouldn't live in fear and be scared by unpopular aspects of Scripture. We don't need to live in fear. We don't need to constantly be, be worried about things. We shouldn't live in fear and be scared by unpopular aspects of Scripture, first of all. And second of all, we are all about spreading the gospel of Jesus. We are all about spreading the news that God loves you. He desperately loves you, and He desperately desires a relationship with you. And so we, we're a lot of things at Lakeside, but understand this. We are always going to default, always going to default to, uh, to opportunities to tell people that God loves them and he desires them. That's just where we're going to always default. And we're all about spreading the hope of Jesus because we look at this world and it's a world that is in desperate, desperate need of hope. This doesn't mean that we shy away from aspects of Scripture that some people have a problem with or some people don't like. But the reality is we're not God. And if we could reason away God, if we could explain everything about God, and frankly, if we liked everything about God, then we really have to question some things about ourselves. And we have to question is, am, I really, am I really understanding who God is, or am I trying to make God in my image? And so I just want you to know, if you struggle with some aspects of, of things about your faith, if you scro- struggle with some aspects of Scripture right now, that's okay, and God's not scared off by that. The danger comes when we try to change God instead of allowing God to change us. That's where things get dangerous and where things go out of whack. But so long as we take our concerns or our frustrations, whatever they may be, and we're honest with God and we let God go to work, God's not scared. We exist to help point people to Jesus. And here's what that means. That means that messed up people make decisions to follow Jesus, and we rejoice about that fact. We rejoice about that fact. But at the same time, following Jesus doesn't change somebody instantaneously. I mean, it changes, it changes you instantaneously in that you cross over from death into life, but sanctification is a process that, has to, that takes time, and it takes the Spirit of God working within you. And any of you who followed Jesus for a number of years, you know this, that God is still at work within you, and there are still things that frustrate you. And that doesn't mean that you don't have enough faith or anything else. And similarly, it doesn't mean that if you, if you need to be spiritually mature, that you reason everything away and you never say, well, I, I have questions about that, or I struggle with No. God is not scared by your questions. God is not scared by your struggle. But we need to make sure that we allow God to change us and we don't try to change God in the process. On some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, he writes. So guess what? That doesn't mean that all of these are received glowingly and everybody's excited about it. That's the hard work sometimes of a spiritual life and that within us, God has to go to work and change things about us to our core that we don't want to change. But God requires it. Because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus, then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. He says, I celebrate. I celebrate what my work has accomplished for God. It's not that I pound my own chest. It's not that I say, look at me, I'm awesome. But I celebrate what God has done. So I want you to know, Lakeside, we're going to celebrate when God works. We're going to celebrate when we, when we set out to start a mission, and when we accomplish that mission, when we see God change lives, when we see God go to work, when we see God show up in ways that blow our minds, we are going to celebrate that. And never, never, never think for a moment that we are celebrating ourselves. No, we are celebrating that God has worked in us, through us, and oftentimes 
in spite of us, not because of us. That's just the truth. But we're going to celebrate those times. And it's not that we're pounding our chest saying lakeside's everything and it's awesome, but we're saying God has worked. And look at what God has done. And that's exciting. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. He is literally, I want you to understand this again, there's a lot of other things going on here, but understand the heart behind this. The Apostle Paul is literally consumed with lives being transformed and souls being being saved. It is what drives his mission. It's literally consuming him. And he constantly points back to saying, look at how God's at work. Look at what God is doing. Look at lives that are being changed. And if these are the things that drive the heart of Jesus, and we know they are, and if these are the things that that drove the men who set up the early church, and we know from Scripture's account that they are, they must be the things that drive us as the local church today. And thus I make it my ambition, he continues, to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is his ambition. This is what drives him. The first missionary to China, his name was C.T. Studd. And he had a quote that I heard for the first time in college, and it's stuck with me ever since, and it's this. Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Here's the deal. That's not safe. And it's not comfortable. And it's not easy. But seldom in life are the things that really matter. Safe. Or comfortable. Or easy. But it is an ambition and a mission that drives us here. And the reason that it drives us here is because when we look at the heart of Jesus, and make no mistake, we want to become more like Jesus. And the New Testament talks about us as the church being his bride so that our passions have to align with the passions of Jesus. When we look at the heart and the passions of Jesus, this is the heart and the passion of Jesus that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. This is our ambition. This is our passion. We really believe that the local church is the hope of the world in a world that desperately needs hope. We exist to provide that hope, to point people to Jesus. And so we've talked about a worship arts pastor. And we've talked about a family life pastor. And today, I want to spend just a couple minutes telling you the third piece of this vision is building expansion. As this physical structure sits now here at Lakeside, as it sits now, this was originally designed to be phase one of three of the building concept. Now, I know some of you have never heard that before. I know some of, you, some of you are brand new, and so you're like, oh, okay, I, I never knew that. Some of you, you, you've known that for a long time. Some of you knew that, and you've forgotten it, and then you knew it again and forgot it again. Uh, but, you know, some of you are just like, ah, oh, why? This is good. We don't, we're good. We're, why, why, do we, why do we need to do anything else? And, and you're like, okay, a family, family life pastor, a worship arts pastor, Building expansion. This is, this is big. This is ambitious. 
And my question is, why would we ever have a vision for God that isn't? Why would we ever have a vision for God that isn't big, that isn't ambitious? This doesn't mean that we're going to be reckless. There is a distinction. And there's a very fine line sometimes between faith and stupidity. And sometimes when you step out in faith, you venture over into stupidity and you didn't realize it because there's a very fine line sometimes. So I want you to understand what we're talking about today. Is it ambitious? Absolutely. Is it reckless? We don't think so. We don't think so. But we understand that in the minds of some people, you may hear this, you may be like, that's tough to swallow. That's a lot. We're not going to be reckless. We're going to try our best not to be stupid. Here's the reality. I refuse to have a small vision for God. We must be ambitious. We must be people who operate in faith. But again, we, are also, we also have capacity. And we talked about this early on in the passage where the Apostle Paul says you are full of goodness, but you're also filled with knowledge. So we're not going to be reckless and we're not going to be stupid. We are going to take a disciplined approach, but understand it is going to be an ambitious approach as we step forward. Why? Because our desire in our prayer is to see lives changed. Our desire in our prayer is to see lives changed. And you may ask, well, what does, what does a building have to, have to do with this? Why would we expand our building? What, what does that have to do with seeing lives changed? And the answer is this. We want to better serve people. We want to better serve people. With increased staffing, and one of the reasons we're increasing our staffing is so that we can offer increased programming. Yes, so that we can take the programs that we also have and we can enhance them and take them to the next level, but also so that we can start new programs as well. Why? Because every single one of you matter. You know that. Nobody has to tell you you individually matter. You're like, I know I matter. I know. You may, not always, you may not always sense that somebody else sees that you matter. And what I'm telling you is we understand here at Lakeside, every single person who walks in those doors matters. And we have an incredible opportunity to help them in the most important relationship they will ever have. This is an incredible responsibility that we never take for granted and we never take lightly that we have the opportunity to walk alongside you and help you become more like Jesus. Or for those of you who haven't made the decision to follow Jesus yet, when you make that best decision of your life and when it changes everything, and it will, we're going to walk right alongside you and help you become more like Him. This is never something we take for granted. And we want to do a better job. We want to launch new programming. With new programming comes a need for more space. We already need to build a storage unit. I'm not talking about a shed. I'm talking about a full storage complex that most people rent out to other people. We need to, we need to just for ourselves, we have so many things we're like, we got two closets to store all of these things in. It's incredible. We're out of storage space. We need enhanced spaces for classrooms, for kids, for students. We need to have an opportunity in some, a great environment for people that they can meet midweek if they choose to do so here. We need to expand our restroom capacities. with additional staffing, is going to be a need to put them in a place so that they can work and they can have meetings. And what is all, what's the point of all this? Enhanced opportunities for you to grow more like Jesus. Enhanced opportunities for us to walk alongside people who've never heard the hope of Jesus and to point them to Jesus. 
We're not trying to build the kingdom of Lakeside. But without apology, we are saying that we want to be ambitious. And we want to point as many people as we possibly can to the hope of Jesus. And we want to come alongside as many people as we possibly can and help them in their journeys of becoming more like Jesus. This is an ambitious vision without apology. And frankly, if we offered you one that wasn't ambitious, you should be angry at us. Because if we're doing it for God, it's not worth doing small. And it's not worth doing that we could explain everything and it would make us feel comfortable. No, if you're following God, then it needs to be something that you say, God, this is yours and God, go to work. I really believe that. But not reckless. And not stupid. And so I want you to know, over the course of the next year, we are going to start the process of drawing plans for building expansion. We have talked about bringing on two additional staff members. And I want you to know we're not going to be reckless and that we will not undertake a building expansion program until all of those positions are fully funded and we have a fully funded budget going forward. We are not going to invite reckless debt that cripples us and stops us from being able to do ministry. But we are going to move forward. And this is where we need you. First, we need you to pray. We need you to pray for Lakeside. Pray for wisdom. Pray for us as we look at expanding the team. Pray that God would raise up the right people and it would be so abundantly clear to us. And God would slam shut every other door so that there is no question whatsoever that the people that are coming to join the team are the right people and they are the people that God has exactly for us. Second, please continue. Please continue faithfully supporting Lakeside. So some of you are thinking, oh, great, here comes the pitch. Got to do more, got to do more. We got to, no, here's the deal. If we will continue to be generous and we will call on God and ask him to work and to show up, then we may in the future have to do a campaign. We, we'll look at all options will be on the table at that time. But right now, what we're asking is for those of you who have been so incredibly generous, and you have, continue your generosity. In a few weeks, we're going to make a budget available to everybody. And we're going to vote on it. And I'm just going to tell you, it's going to be bigger than this year's budget. And the reason? Because we want to move forward. We want to reach more people. We want to expand. We're ambitious without apology. But what drives us is the fact this world desperately needs hope. And we have the answer. We can't keep it to ourselves. God, I pray that we would be ambitious without apology and yet not reckless. That we'd be full of goodness and love and also full of knowledge. That we would be driven by seeing people make the decision to follow you.
God, thank you for what you have accomplished in this place. And Lord, we pray that you'll continue to work. Continue to move. God, we would ask that you would do something so incredible that we couldn't take credit for it ourselves. That when we look, the only explanation would be you. God, give us wisdom. Give us clarity. Give us unity. Help our hearts beat for what makes your heart beat. Let us see lives changed. And Jesus glorified. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.